Um, yeah. yeah, just to add on, uh, 20 years ago, perhaps uh, people of Kathmandu will not be thinking about uh, harvesting rain. Even at a personal level, we tried with, you know, tackling some of the larger institutional questions. Clearly, you know, it's kind of a blind alley, you know, where there is no hearing and so on and so forth. But then you do, uh, you know, go and try to, you know, look at some of the uh, more localized solutions. And rainwater harvesting, particularly for the household level in Kathmandu, has kind of taken on now. He talked about, you know, tank in his, you know, residence. I harvest rain last 10, 10, 10, 10, 12 years, but then use that water for flushing toilet, you know. And then I also um, recharge groundwater, you know, the excess water that comes from my tank. The basic argument, you know, lots of people say, well, it's not sufficient. Yes, it's not sufficient. It does meet my need. We had rainfall that started from April this year and lasted till about September. So for that six months period, I didn't have to weigh, use the municipal supply and then turn it into, you know, sewer. sewer. So uh, sort of an ethical argument saying, look, I'm harvesting rain within my premise and then using that water to uh, flush the waste. The still the problem of, you know, it going through the septic tank system into the you know sewer line into the river that still remains but at least at the personal level and i can make an ethical argument that i'm not turning you know treated municipal water into sewer using rain water by making my own investment or producing water from within and then giving back to nature you know the water that i capture within my my premise right this argument and this logic, at least it meets part of your need. Lots of people are sort of, you know, attracted by it. Not everybody. Uh, if you go to Kathmandu, one of the things you'll be fascinated is you'll find solar water heater in every home in Kathmandu. Every home in Kathmandu has solar water heater. And that came through basically market mechanism. You can buy these systems. Perhaps, you know, we could think of a time in Kathmandu, maybe 15 years down the line, where every household will have uh, a local rainwater harvesting system that they use for at least flushing toilet. You could use it for drinking and other needs, but a more stewardship it needs it. You know, you'd have to maintain it, you'll have to clean it, you have to ensure the quality is right, so on and so forth. For flushing toilet, you don't have to worry about the quality, and that makes my life easy. So that's one. On your concern, yeah, groundwater has been kind of, you know, used extensively, particularly in recent time with uh, access of mechanized technology, right? But the trick with groundwater is, you know, it has to be harvested. You know, it has to be filled. You can't go on mining it. But then there is so much extraction in many, many places. The groundwater levels are going exceedingly <coughs> low. And, uh, you know, in some places, you know, they're getting dark. I mean, there's no groundwater. So perhaps a little more, a little more, you know, sensitivity is required in tackling uh, groundwater issue under the ground. A very quick question, um, and that it's more of a query, really. Um, it, when, when I was in Kathmandu recently, um, when I was doing some basic, I spoke to you about things. Um, most of the city is is still on septic tanks, even now, and. So if you have the, uh, a certain kind of paradigm, okay, that we, you know, of, of water engineering and engineering-led kinds of interventions, uh, and you do get a lot of these people who are not on the sewer lines right now connected to the sewer lines, is, isn't it going to really increase uh, the pollution load of the Bagmati right now? Because it seems to me, if you look at the Bagmati action plan and things like that, I mean, the whole approach to that is, okay, let's let's at least get this sewage into a sewer lines and then we'll treat it and then we will uh, you know put push it back into the river um, how is that going to pan out i mean what is your prediction if suddenly 80% of the city comes on to the main sewer lines and you don't have um, because when i saw the sewage treatment plants there i mean they were frankly not functioning uh, and they haven't been functioning for a while i mean there are problems with electricity and these are all electricity led things some of the uh, decentralized sewage plants were actually being led as uh, you know as football fields and things like that i mean so you don't have the the engineering capacity or or even perhaps the money to actually run these fancy sewage plants but then you have plans in place and perhaps money coming in uh, to to convert your septic tanks into uh, or, or to 
move the population away from septic tanks and into uh, sewage lines. Uh, it's going to be a bit of an issue, I think. Uh, let me try answering this. You know, I talked about cities as a force for good. Uh, one of the arguments that we're making with cities as a force for good is no longer to see cities in the traditional sense that we see it, you know, with settlements and high-rise and, you know, water-borne sewerage flushing system and all that, but to begin from the other end and to see cities as nutrient flows. Okay. Now, there are rudiments of this in Nepal already happening, but again, you know, there is, it's, it's like an informal underground economy that's not got official salience. It does require some kind of governmental uh, sort of encouragement of tax breaks and all kinds of things, you know, that to get it really going, but it's functioning. You can see signs on, posted on telephone poles and all that saying, you know, call this number and you want your treatment sewerage, this thing removed. So somebody comes with a pump and a tank and they pump it out, you know, your septic tank. And what these guys do with that is take it somewhere else and mix it with soil and all that and becomes wonderful fertilizer which they sell. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, money going in that. Now, if this can be done and cities become this force for good, then as a nutrient flow system, if there's the value in uh, and that's properly socially acknowledged through institutional means, then what happens is the nutrient cycling starts taking place in a big way and you don't have to put all that nutrient, uh, you know, calling it waste is a bad name, but putting calling it nutrients that, you know, feed the bacteria uh, is a different thing. Okay. Organic farming. Uh, the organic farming is taking it up. I mean, there's a problem with all the phosphorus and all that, but there are ways of getting rid of all these things, you know, and or separating them and people have done it. So, the idea is to rethink of cities as nutrient flows, re-engineer your cities through these kind of institutional means, rather than only having the civil engineering kind of thinking of getting transbasin transfer as the only uh, solution. Start from this other end, or at least allow institutions that think from the other end, the space to think from the other end. And that would probably provide the answer. I would like to make one particular point. I think, uh, do you want to say permission. something? Did you want to say it? Okay. Yeah. Put, put the mic on. Yeah. You see, uh, similar problem exists in their old countries all over the world, and especially, I think, uh, the problem parties which were taken care of was by the Tolokias and the Pandavas by putting up an app. Anikats. These anikats are very interesting things. They serve two different purposes. That since the rainfall pattern is well, the monsoon based, which is only four months a year, and the rest of it is mostly dry, they hold the water for irrigation throughout the year. Second, they get flushed with all what we are talking about, sewage and all which is taken care of by the fish and the tortoise and the water uh, animals that feed on that. The result is what is going into, let's say, in Thinner Valley, which has become the rice bowl of India, and that 1,000-year-old anikat, the grand anikat on the Kaveri, is worth noticing. Why can't we take that kind of a pattern? not only in India, but in Nepal and northeast in um, uh, portions of our country, where this would be more helpful in getting the irrigation around the year and, and irrigating certain areas which have become absolutely dry and the other areas which could be also brought in with the uh, certain amount of water availability around the year. Now, in these check dams, if you may call them, we have started in India. The check dams and other things, uh, rainwater harvesting and others. And I suggest, uh, I'm sure Nepal is aware, aware of that. And um, we could pos possibly multiply those uh, for the benefit of everyone. Yeah, we have. We Do you want to take that question? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I apologize for asking a very elemental question and it's going to divert a little bit. How are we seeing water? As in, are we seeing water as a human right or are we seeing water as a commodity? 
And the fact that I asked this question is that if you see it as a human right, then I understand we are asking questions of who owns it, who manages it, or who is responsible for it. And I completely agree with the uh, McKinsey report in involving the lowest level or the lowest unit people and having a bottom-up approach. So we are treating it as a human right. And then the supply options and the d supply side management, I can understand that. But what if, if we are treating it as a commodity, then uh, all these market mechanisms uh, that we are talking about are the pricing methodology for uh, having efficient water management uh, can be understood. So like in India, I know uh, because 42 million people don't even have access to clean water, um, we treat it as a human right. Uh, what is the situation in Nepal? Do you treat, would you treat it as a human right or would you treat it as a commodity? Thank you. Yeah. Well, this gets into interesting debate. When you ascribe water as human right, fine, you know, the basic quantity, say 25 liters per capita per day, is something that's assured. Uh, but the other debate is perhaps, you know, you could take a more ethical debate. Right, you say, all right, we provide the basic, you know, amount to meet certain needs, uh, and that's happening anyway, yeah. right? Uh, particularly given the fact that our court systems are so overloaded, uh, getting into a sort of a more legalistic uh, way might kind of, you know, it does kind of bring in state into a sort of a, you know, responsive, accountable domain. But then operationalizing that might be, you know, uh, problematic. That's one. Uh, and you could perhaps get away by this debate by thinking about paying for the service. All right, natural water may be free, but then to get that water into a community level, you know, tap or spring does involve cost. So perhaps you could get around by the debate by saying, you know, you pay for the service, and then the service payment does not have to go to say, a private operator. So in Nepal, for example, it is community groups which manage water supply systems, community-based water supply systems. They raise tariff. You know, they do invest. The investor, whether it's the government-funded project or the bank-funded project or NGO-funded project, upfront put, depending upon the nature of the project, 10 to 15 percent <coughs> of the cost uh, in developing that particular uh, system. And then the local institution decide on the tariff, you know, for operation and maintenance. And that money does not go to any individual profit. It goes to the community fund. And some of this community fund could be, you know, to the extent of, say, uh, I could take a, one example is some group would, would have maybe three to four lakhs rupees, you know, period of about 10 years. And the challenge now, you know, what do you do with that money, right? So there is a way out. But they clearly, you know, you could, you could, uh, you could ascribe, you know, you could define water as a human right, and the United Nations has actually done that. So, so we, we have no problem with that. I just wanted to tack on, you know, sort of respond to your point. At the moment, if you look at the trend in Kathmandu, it's a gone case, all right? Not just the septic tank. The septic tank's outlet, you know, actually are connected with all these, you know, numerous sewer lines that's coming in, and then that goes into all the different tributaries of Bagmati and ultimately coming to that river. The, yeah. Uh, so the problems with uh, operating these, you know, isolated treatment plants are humongous. They're very energy in, in, in incentive intensive. Uh, they require capacity. We don't have that capacity. They require resources. So those problems remain. Other problem, other challenge is the the high rise sort of you know phenomena that's massively come in Kathmandu. You know, one high rise building would have 400 flats. Now just think of the density in terms of its water need and in terms of the waste it produces, where it's going to go. Clearly, that high-rise enterprise is not going to have its own individual treatment unit. It's ultimately going to go to, you know, the river, which has become a drain. So the current trend, you know, the, the, the real estate and urbanization trend, you know, demonstrates that it's going to be a gone case for a while before we begin to see a change. Can I answer this? Yeah. Uh, you know, picking up on that question, it's not or. It's an and and thing. Water is an and and thing, you know. It's not an or thing. It's not a is it a right or a commodity. It is also a right and also a commodity and also many other things besides. So we really have to look at water in that uh, uh, multiple sense. And what we are arguing is, you know, you need to give that space 
to these different types of organizing that see water in these very different ways. Some might work in one context better, another one might fail, but as long as you have the pluralism in place, you are much more resilient. Society as a whole is more resilient. What we see is of these different types of organizing, you can see water as a private good. I mean, we are treating water as a private good. It's very much right here. I don't know how much environment we talk, but still we use this. Okay. We see water as a public good, which is what the municipal water tap is all about. Who has the right to how much, when, and it's all regulated in there. But water is also a common pool good in the sense of rivers and ponds and lakes and waterfalls and so on. And sadly, water is also a club good. The club good is, you know, in um, Bombay, I, they've changed the new airport, but with the old airport, I remember, you land there and you pass this big slum. And when India started that liberalization, I remember, in the late 90s, it was a very interesting sign. And there was an ad of one of these very fancy, I forget, Dom Perrier or one of these fancy waters, right next to that slum. A big hoarding board, okay? So we said that's a club good because that is a mirage that you have no access to simply because you do not belong to the club which can pay for it. So you get the faithless with water as a club good, you get the market as a private good, you get the governmental, you know, official dumb as public good, and you get the activist groups working to see water as a common pool good. And if you give this space to all of them, you probably get a plethora of technologies working with many 10% solutions. So uh, to add to what Ajay talked about, you know, one of the successes in Nepal has been that community organization in not just water, uh, Ajay chairs uh, an organization called NEWA, Nepal Water for Health. It's a technical NGO which has provided over the last, what, 10 years, something like water for about a million people in very remote hamlets. And that's half the story. The other half of the story is that they're doing it at one third the cost of the ADB and the World Bank. Uh, and it do one third, okay, per household or per project. And interestingly, you know, their cost when you disaggregate per, per, uh, per, for hardware and software, well, with the World Bank and others being three times higher, it's 66% on software because they get these fancy consultants and 33% for hardware. Whereas on Neva's case, it's 33% cheaper and 66% of the cost is on hardware. And that's how it operates. And this is all done by communities. And Nepal Community Forestry, Aditya is down to earth, has been pr producing these stories, community electricity. These are success stories. So I think there is hope in Nepal in the sense that, that institutional pluralism is still there no matter what has happened. Finally, you know, that one question you asked and I missed it, which was, you mentioned that, uh, is it happening in cities with these ponds? So, interestingly, yes, because traditionally our kind of societies and it's down to earth, who's Anil Agrawal, the late Anil Agrawal, who started this whole thing about collect water where it falls rather than where it concentrates. Uh, ponds technologies are suited to our hydroecology. We are a semi-arid zone with four months of rain and six, eight months of drought, okay? So you collect wherever it falls. And in Kathmandu too, ponds technologies have come from the time of the lichwis, you know, and uh, some of these systems are still functioning like these uh, spouts uh, based on ponds and other technologies for the last 1200, 1300 years, some of them are functioning from 800 or 700, 600 BC, AD. Now, in one of the interesting things in Nepal, uh, the lack of government that we have is, has been a blessing to some. And the blessing has been that these old temples, which had small ponds next to them, the two right next to the house where I live in, in part of Patan, they've been revived by the community. They got together, somebody found out that there's this temple of Siddhi Lakshmi or there's a temple of something. And uh, the idea that this pond is just completely a sewage dumping site or something is, uh, go, has got to go. So people got together in communities and they've restored these ponds. And one of the beauty of that restoration has been, first of all, is next to a temple and people feel much better having a nice pond next to a temple rather than a um, dumping space. And uh, they found out that the wells around the community had more water and did not go dry for an extra month in the dry season or so the water stress got reduced by about two to four weeks you know now it's great success story for that to replicate across we need a government you know you can't do without a government innovation happened without a government thank god but you know without the dead hand of a government but once that success is there to get that success really 
replicated all over, you do need legislation which says every household must have rainwater collection that goes, and if nothing else, to a recharge area or something like that. And this should be part of the municipal code and tax breaks should be given to people who set these things up. Now, these kind of innovations are what we are really looking for. And it has happened in, 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 in very, very urban areas too. So I think, and these things, you know, what you mentioned about, you know, these, uh, you know, these underground dams and doing things that depends on the geology, but certain areas are amenable to these kind of solutions, whether they're larger or smaller solutions. Huh? So I think what we are arguing for in the, the bottom line is we are arguing for pluralism in water management and a plural approach that allows for multiple technologies pushed by multiple kind of, you know, internal callings, so to speak, of institutions.